So John, this time we're talking about the book of Daniel, a book that you are uh, one of the world's leading experts in. Uh, perhaps the place to start is with the name and the person. That is, this is a book that is named after its main character, much like many of the prophetic books that are named after, we assume, prophets who lived and spoke these words. But that's not quite what's happening with Daniel. This is really a book about Daniel rather than a book by Daniel. Was there an actual Daniel? Most probably not. Now, I suppose there must have been some people called Daniel, mm -hmm. but not the person who's described in this book. So what we get is, in the first six chapters or so, is the development of a persona. Mm -hmm. So that there's a certain character, you might even say invented. Now, we know that Daniel was a name attached to a legendary famous person because it comes up twice in the book of Ezekiel where he's linked with people like Noah and Job. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's the, the question asked, are you wiser than Daniel? Now, if you believe what, literally what's in the book of Daniel, uh, Ezekiel and Daniel were contemporaries. Right. But obviously, the allusions here are to a famous ancient person. Somebody like Noah, you know, back in the time of the flood, or Job, where nobody knows when he was supposed to have lived. Right. So, and there, there's, yeah. there's a reference to, there are references to a Daniel-like figure, at least a similar name, right? Daniel, even back in Ugaritic literature from the 13th, 14th century BC. There, there are. Now, it should be said, you know, the character in the book of Daniel isn't much like the right. character in the Ugaritic uh, scrolls. But really, I think Daniel, they just take the name mm -hmm. and they give him a new persona. Now, the name means something like, God is my judge. Mm -hmm. um, you, he only shows up judging once, actually, in the story of Susanna, and we probably won't even get to talk about that, right. given certain people's canonical prejudices. <laughs> but um, but, but the, the character that we have here is supposedly a young man deported from Jerusalem to Babylon, mm -hmm. and then singled out with a couple of his companions uh, for a special education. Yeah, what we have really throughout the book, and you know, we'll get into the details as we, as we go through the chapters in more detail, but there is sort of story after story of this Daniel figure in generation after generation, but his role is the same in, in almost every case. That is, he is almost always some sort of advisor or wise person or dream interpreter, it's specifically situated in the foreign courts of, uh, of the king, uh, which makes Daniel part of a larger genre of, uh, of tales, of which there are numerous examples elsewhere in the Bible already. Indeed. Uh, now, the, the, the length of his career is one of the problems. It is. Uh, if you, you know, ask, why can't you take this as historically accurate? Mm -hmm. Well, he's supposedly a, a young man in his late teens, perhaps, in 597, although the, the, the actual date of the deportation is a bit botched in the mm -hmm. book as well. But then he goes on all the way to Cyrus of Persia. This is a good 60 years later, and he's still in business. Yeah. Now, that's stretching it, maybe not entirely impossible. Right. There are worse stretches in the <laughs> book. Uh, we'll meet a character called Darius the Mede, not known to history outside of the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. whereas Darius was the name of a couple of the Persian kings. Right. Uh, the, 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 how they get the Medes in there is another question, mm -hmm. because the Medes never had anything to do with the Judeans at all. Yeah, I think there's a general question when you read the book of Daniel about its historical setting. Uh, it is set originally, as you said, in the time of the Babylonian exile, it then stretches in time into the rise of Persia. When approximately would we think that the book was written? Well, I suppose we need to back up one other step. The book, it falls very obviously into two halves. Mm -hmm. And it does this in two different ways. Because if you think in terms of genre, the first six chapters are stories about Daniel. Mm -hmm. And as you say, this is a common enough type of story. Joseph, Some, 
Joseph, Esther, Esther being the, the famous examples, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a very definite pattern to it. Mm -hmm. uh, several of them end in very much the same way. Mm -hmm. It's like watching episodes in a sitcom. That's right. Uh, now, the other division is by language. Right. Because six chapters of the book of Daniel are in Aramaic. And it's not just the first six. Right. It's chapters two to seven. Yeah. And this is, no. Okay, what, what do we infer from this? The, the basic stories, I would figure, originally were in Aramaic. Mm -hmm. Probably circulated orally, mm -hmm. went through a fairly long process of transmission. And then at some point, somebody wanted to pull these together and wrote a nice introduction to them. Mm -hmm. And now, that may have been in Aramaic, but we don't have it in Aramaic. My guess is that it was translated into Hebrew. Mm -hmm when they were editing the whole book as a way of kind of tying the book together. Mm -hmm. But then uh, in the second century BC, in the time of the Maccabees, in the time of stirring events that we need to talk about in a little bit more we detail, um, then somebody wrote visions in the name of Daniel. Now, these are quite different in genres, different kind of literature from what you have in the first six chapters. Mm -hmm. But the first one of these is also in Aramaic. And then they switch to Hebrew. Hmm. Now, you've got to figure that they were bilingual. But at the same time, I think probably it's in the enthusiasm of the Maccabean revolt and the, the kind of Judean revival of that period <clears throat> that you get the preference for Hebrew. Right. And it should be said the Hebrew is very bad. <laughs> Right. So what we're looking at is really a book that probably spans a significant uh, length of time in terms of its composition. It might not have been composed as early as the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, where, where it starts in, in terms of narrative, but there's no reason to think that some parts of it weren't relatively early, and then other parts of it are, are much later. That's right. Uh, the first, uh, the stories, you know, probably go back you know, in some form to the Persian period, mm -hmm. uh, but at least to the third century. Mm -hmm. But these, I would assume, you know, evolved over time. But then once you get to the visions, these were all written within the space of about three or four years. Right. And, and we, we know, know this that. because they have historical reference. Because they have historical references. Mm -hmm. And you know, as far as the date of the book as a whole goes, uh, in the last vision in the book, there's a long prediction of history, yes. and it ends with the death of Antiochus Epiphanes, which is not mentioned by name, but he's very recognizable. Mm -hmm. And they get that wrong. They've gotten everything else right up to that point, uh -huh. except that they say that he will die between the sea and the holy mountain. Whereas, in fact, he died. He, he died over in the east in Parthia. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this gives us a very nice date for the final composition of the book. It was before the death of the king, which happened in December of 164 BCE. Before that was known in Jerusalem. Right. This must have been finished. Good. So, so what we have then is um, stories about a figure, and then that figure has sort of been elevated <laughs> and used for visions later on, uh, somewhat separate from, from the original stories. Uh, and this is actually, this is a process that we know from other biblical figures who, where the figure sort of emerges from, from its original context and is reused. You can think uh, certainly of figures like Ezra, who uh, is the, yes. you know, the, the scribe in, in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and then in later, uh, later writings becomes you know, far, more, uh, far more important and also receives visions and the like. Um, this seems to be another yeah. sort of part of that kind of uh, kind of reuse of a character. Even arguably, I suppose you could say Moses. I would, for, for I would you certainly get, say you Moses. Know, a huge tradition that he picks up as he goes along. And I should say in the case of Daniel, uh, there are other Danielic books besides the ones we we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, there are in the Greek Bible, you already have two stories added at the end the story of Balaam the dragon, and the story of Susanna. Right. And there are prayers inserted in chapter 3, the prayer of Azariah and the song of the three young men in mm -hmm. the fiery furnace. Mm 
And then in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have at least two other compositions, uh, at, at least two that mention Daniel by name, that are like the kind of revelations you have at the second half of Daniel. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that they are necessarily dependent on it. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, this would indicate that it was fashionable at some point to make, have compositions in the name of Daniel. But, and also that what we're looking at is something of an open corpus. That is, the Daniel that we have as a book need not have been... Right? <clears throat> there were other ways that you could have included, as you say. The Greek has more Daniel than the, yeah. than the, uh, than the Hebrew. Uh, some of these Dead Sea, uh, Dead sea compositions could have also been in it. It was, it was sort of a, a rolling corpus that allowed for more to, to enter yes, into it. Yes, and it's a little bit arbitrary where mm -hmm. you cut it off. Right. And even within the book as we have it, the Greek of chapters 4 and 5 is wildly different from what we have in the Aramaic. And that, again, I think indicates probably oral transmission. Right. But it, it would seem that a lot of, I mean, a lot of the fact that some of the stories are repetitive, are very similar to each other. Yeah. Chapters 3 and 6 are very similar. Chapters 7 and 8 are very similar. I mean, we have very similar kinds of material as if we have, as we said, sort of a collection of all of yes. the Daniel material that was out there or that somebody could get their hands on. Um, yeah. Now, uh, you know, you raised the question, comparing this with some of the prophets, mm -hmm. this isn't actually supposed to be a book written by Daniel. Now, the second half of it is re reports by Daniel, mm -hmm. all right, but the first half isn't. I think, but when you get into the part that is put in the mouth of Daniel, this brings us to the problem of pseudepigraphy. Mm -hmm. And this is something that still bothers some people. But, now and then. but I don't think either of us is, is one of those people. I don't no. think either of us is bothered by the idea of an ancient writer putting his ideas in the mouth of a famous, uh, famous sort of sage no, actually, of Israel. Actually, if you read enough ancient literature, you realize this happens all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a very common thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a famous professor at Oxford in the middle of the 19th century named Pusey who said that if Daniel did not indeed speak these things, he must have lied on a frightful scale. Mm -hmm. Or somebody must have lied on a frightful yeah. scale. Now, you see, that is actually a lack of any kind of literary sensitivity, right. uh, of an appreciation of literary conventions. So, so <clears throat> let me ask this then. How, as people coming to the book of Daniel now, recognizing it as a collection of stories somewhat arbitrary, not quite historical, written over a period of time. Is there a way of reading the book sort of as a whole, of making sense of this as a, as a unit of literature? How do we think about Daniel um, as, we, as we come to it today with, with this sort of knowledge in mind? Well, you see, there are certain themes that unite the book. And I'd say the main one is the revelation of mysteries. Mm -hmm. This is what Daniel is good at. Now, so in chapter 2, we'll find he interprets a dream. In chapter 4, he interprets a dream. Later on, he'll interpret writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. And that, in a way, sets the stage for further revelation of mysteries. They get upgraded in the second half of the book. Daniel can't understand them anymore. You need an angel to come in. But there's some continuity in that. Mm -hmm. There is also some continuity in the idea of people's lives being put at risk because of the stand they take for their faith. Now, in the first half of the book, it's the three young men get thrown into a fiery furnace. Daniel gets thrown into a lion's den. At the end of the book, you'll hear of the wise, so-called, mm -hmm. the Hebrew is maskilim, who, uh, who will be you know, in a time of persecution. Some of them will be killed. And uh, now, again, there are differences, because in the first half, there's this miraculous deliverance at the last minute. In the second half, you've got to wait for a resurrection. Right. And so uh, there is continuity, all right, but at the same time, there's a really abrupt change. Yeah. I think uh, one, of the, one of the exciting things about, about talking about Daniel is it really unlike almost any other book in, uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and so I'm excited that we're going to get a chance to, to get into it uh, in a little more detail.